Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Paul's Ivy on this, the third Sunday after the Epiphany. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning for Holy Eucharist and worship. You can listen to our service by rolling down your windows and listening through our speaker system if you'd like. It's a pretty nice day today. The sun is shining. Or you can listen to us on FM radio 96.7. Or you can watch the service and listen to it on your phone. If you go to the St. Paul's Ivy Facebook page, there's a live stream that is currently showing our service. So many ways for you to engage in worship this morning. Our opening hymn today is Sing Praise to God who reigns above, and as always, I encourage you to joyfully sing in your car. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and procl proclaim it, to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nivea, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. reading is from Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, 
and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. After John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I thought we'd spend some time this morning talking about something that is actually pretty offensive. Now, I, I didn't really run this by Justin, so if you get offended, don't take it out on him. You can just bring it to me. We're not gonna talk about money. We're not gonna talk about politics, none of that. No, what we are gonna talk about this morning is even more offensive. It is the grace of God. Our catechism de defines grace as God's favor toward us, unearned and undeserved. By grace, God forgives our sins, enlightens our minds, stirs our hearts, and strengthens our wills. I like this definition too. This one comes from the Roman Catholic Catechism. They define grace as the free and undeserved help that God gives us 
to respond to his call, to become children of God, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. Free and undeserved help. What could be possibly so offensive about that? We have an example, or maybe two, in our reading this morning from Jonah. Now we only get a small snippet of Jonah this morning, so I thought it'd be good to review the story for those of you who maybe haven't read it for a while. So Jonah is one of two prophets in all of the Hebrew Bible who is called by God to go and deliver a message to a people outside of Israel, to a place outside of Israel. And Jonah isn't called to just any place outside of Israel. He is called by God to go to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, the nation that had laid siege to the northern kingdom of Israel, killing widows and children, taking many into captivity and destroying Jerusalem. So it's no wonder that Jonah might be a little resistant to going to this place and delivering God's word to those people. Those people who, by all accounts, were very bad people. And Jonah knew that if he went and delivered this message from God to those very bad people, they might have a chance to repent. And God could even possibly spare them. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. He refused to participate. He refused to be a part of anything that might possibly save the very people he hated most. So he set out in precisely the opposite direction, to the west, to Tarshish, a seaport on what was then considered the edge of the known world. He wanted to get as far away from God and his God-given task as he possibly could. But when he gets to the boat in Tarshish, he gets on and they set off and a huge storm comes upon the sea. And the other folks on the boat are very afraid and they start throwing all their cargo into the ocean in the hopes of saving their lives. But the storm won't let up. Well, eventually the captain and the sailors figure out that this might have something to do with Jonah. And Jonah says, yes, yes, it's probably my fault. I'm trying to get away from what my God wants me to do for him. So Jonah convinces them to throw him into the sea to save themselves by dumping him off in the ocean. So they throw him into the sea and instantly the storm stops. The people on the boat begin to praise God. And Jonah thinks he's finally gotten out of this task he doesn't want to do by choosing to drown in the sea. But Jonah doesn't get away from this task or from God because God sends a large fish to swallow him up. Right? This is the part most people are very familiar with. Jonah lived in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights, where he sang a beautiful song of praise and thanksgiving to God for saving his life. After those three days and nights, God makes the fish spit Jonah out onto the dry land, and Jonah is thankful and amazed that he has survived. So when God tells him for a second time to go to Nineveh and to give this message to the people there, Jonah does. And this is what we get in our reading today. Jonah goes and tells the citizens of Nineveh, 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. Overthrown. This is interesting because that word overthrown can also be translated as turned around or transformed. Right? Those three words have different meanings for us. So there's layers here. It's, it's not only a threat, but it could also be interpreted to be an invitation to repent. And it's this one sentence from God, spoken through this reluctant prophet's mouth, that causes the people of Nineveh, including the king, to repent. They turn from their evil ways and their violence, and they believe that God will change his mind about destroying them. And God did change his mind. He gave them the grace to repent and believe. And he showed them mercy. He saved them all. Now, of course, this really upsets Jonah, right? Who has been hoping for the destruction of these people who had caused 
so much death and destruction to his own people. So he gets really mad and he prays to God and he says, Lord, I knew this would happen. This is why I didn't want to come here in the first place. He says, because I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. He's basically throwing a tantrum here and stomping his feet and saying, God, this isn't fair. Well, the story doesn't end all that well for our friend Jonah. In his anger and great offense, he goes off into the desert to sit in the sun and pout and sulk, hoping to die. But God raises up a bush to give him some shade and some comfort, and then God makes that bush die to illustrate the point that Jonah's care and sorrow for the loss of a bush that he didn't plant, that he had nothing to do with growing, was infinitesimal compared to God's immeasurable love for the people he himself created, even the people in Nineveh. And that's why he offered them a chance to repent and believe through the message that Jonah delivered. I think we can all understand Jonah's frustration and anger here. Who doesn't get upset when someone we think is undeserving gets forgiven? We see it not only in our daily lives, but all throughout the Bible. We see it especially in the story of the prodigal son, right? Where the son that leaves home and wastes his inheritance is welcomed back into the father's arms with love and joy and great celebration. And all of that is very offensive to the son who never left, to the one who stayed and worked and lived up to the father's expectations. It's just part of our human nature to be upset when we think other people are getting away with bad behavior. But there is good news for us today from this story of Jonah and God and the Ninevites. First, God's word is for all people, not just the Israelites, all people, even us. God's word is meant for every single human being ever. And that in itself is an example of God's amazing grace. And second, yes, God's grace is offensive. It is absolutely and completely unfair that people who don't deserve God's grace can receive it. We see how offensive that, what, that grace is in our story today from Jonah, in the saving of Nineveh, and when God saves Jonah himself, the disobedient prophet, the one who did exactly the opposite of what God wanted him to do. In both of these cases, God shows grace and mercy to people who, by all accounts, do not deserve it. But we don't deserve it either. That's what God's grace is, a gift, a free offering of love and mercy and help to follow God's will for us from the God who created us, available for all of us, as imperfect or even evil as we may be. And that is absolutely offensive. But that's also the good news this morning. We don't have to be the best or the brightest or the most athletic or the most attractive or the most successful people to earn God's grace. Because God loves each and every person he's ever created, including you and me, and he offers us this grace and mercy at every turn of our lives, regardless of how the world sees us. It's just as Jesus preached in that first sermon we heard today on the shore of Galilee. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. That word from God is meant for us all. The kingdom of God has come near to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And we are all called to repent, to turn away from the ways that we deny and ignore God. And we are all called to believe, to believe the good news that God wants to give his grace to us all. The Roman Catholic Bishop Robert Barron says this about what it means to believe this good news. To believe, as Jesus uses the term, 
signals not so much a way of knowing as a way of being known. To have faith is to allow oneself to be overwhelmed by the power of God, to permit the divine energy to reign at all levels of one's being. As such, it is not primarily a matter of understanding and assenting to propositions, as it is surrendering to the God who wants to become incarnate in us. Believing this good news is about surrendering to God, to God who wants to forgive us, to God who wants to shower us with his grace and mercy and love. And so today we are called to respond to the word of God in Jesus, just like the Ninevites responded to the word of God from Jonah to repent of all that stands between us and our belief in the good news that is ultimately a surrender. Surrendering ourselves to the grace that God pours out upon us. Trusting in the God Jonah describes as gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. None of us deserve the riches of God's grace, not a single one of us. But it's there for us anyway, regardless of how deserving or undeserving we might feel. And that is good news, really good news. Good news we can believe, good news we can surrender to, and good news we can be thankful for. Amen. Affirming together now our Christian faith, using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all of your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I invite now your prayers of intercession and thanksgiving. Gracious and loving God, who never gives up on us, who always seeks us out, we lift up to you today the prayers in our hearts, our petitions, our intercessions, our thanksgivings. We ask that you fulfill them as may be best for us, enabling us to be your disciples in the world, people who love you deeply and love their neighbors as themselves. All this we pray in the life-giving, redeeming, transforming name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for Holy Communion, let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to honk your horns and share the peace.
Well, good morning once again. We are so glad that you are with us today. If you are visiting us for the first time, we would love to connect with you and tell you more about our programs and ministries here. There is a newcomer form on the back of the bulletin. Feel free to fill it out and tear it out and place it in the offertory baskets that are going around at this time and we'll be in touch with you. We say it here at St. Paul's and we mean it. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith this morning, you are welcome here just as you are to receive the blessings of new and unending life in Jesus Christ. That invitation is for you and all people. Welcome. In just a few weeks, we're going to begin a new church season. Hard to believe, but it comes quickly. And that is the season of Lent. A time when we prepare ourselves for Easter. For the heart of our Christian faith, the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The last day before Lent starts is typically known as Shrove Tuesday. It is the last day to sort of celebrate and feast before the Lenten fast. Of course, this year we are unable to gather together in person for our usual pancake supper in advance of Lent. So we're going to be doing something a little differently. And we have some special guests with us this morning. Consider this a personal privilege. My three children, one of whom is a big, big fan of pancakes, and she wants to share an announcement with you. Joelle? Hello, everyone. We'll be having a pancake supper on February 16th from 6 to 7. If you know me, you should know that I love pancakes. So please join us on Zoom for Show of Tuesday. Wonderful. February 16th, 6 to 7 p.m., we're going to have a Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper on Zoom. Invite you to check your weekly emails for more information and for the Zoom link. We're going to all gather together and share a pancake supper from our homes and give thanks for the blessings that God has bestowed upon us in our life and prepare for Lent. Lent starts the next day with Ash Wednesday. And we will have a service on Ash Wednesday here at noon, a drive-in church service. We are not permitted to impose the ashes directly on you, but you will have a bag of ashes given to you uh, that you can use for the self-imposition of ashes within your car. And more will be explained on that at the time. We will also be pre-recording a Ash Wednesday service if you are unable to join us at noon that you can watch at any point during the day. And we are working on making sure that you have, even if you are unable to join us at noon, a little bag of ashes that you can take with you at home and do the self-imposition. Starting next Sunday, there will be bags that will be passed out as you leave the service that have some fun things for Shrove Tuesday for the Pancake Supper and we'll include things for Lent. So look for that next Sunday. As you prepare yourself for Holy Communion, I invite you to remember these words from St. Paul. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us. In creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, 
And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with St. Paul and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Thy Strong Word Did Cleave the Darkness. and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As you exit today, you're, you're welcome to stay and enjoy the music for as long as you like, but as you exit today, we ask that you exit through this uh, driveway. The vergers here will help um, guide you forward. Uh, that'll help us avoid some congestion in the parking lot.